Welcome to Lesson 3. The brief history of Philippine art will be discussed here. In this lecture file, the following will be covered. First, the two general branches of Philippine art will be described and briefly discussed. It will then be followed by the development of Philippine art in line with the history of our country. Philippine art has two branches. Traditional, ethnic, or folk arts are creations that are a part of the culture of a group of people in the Philippines. The skills and forms are passed down through generations from master craftsmen to apprentices. Philippine traditional arts encompass folk architecture, maritime transport, weaving, carving, folk performing our arts, folk or oral literature, folk graphic and plastic arts, ornament, textile or fiber art, pottery, and other artistic expressions of traditional culture. People who are bearers of traditional arts can be nominated as Gawad Manilikana Bayan or Gamaba, which is an equal award to the National Artist Award. Apuwang Od, the well-known traditional tattoo artist or Mambabatok, and the last of our generation has been officially nominated for the 2020 Gawad sa Manilikana Bayad Award, or in English, the National Living Treasures Award by the NCCA. Non-traditional arts, on the other hand, encompass dance, music, theater, visual arts, literature, film, and broadcast arts, architecture, and allied arts, as well as design or the major art forms. The bearer of non-traditional arts can be nominated as National Artist equal to the Gamaba Award. An example awardee is Jose Garcia Villa, if you still remember him, from Humanities 14. He was given the award in 1973. Let us now look at the progression of Philippine art forms in line with our country's history. Our past is often viewed with an air of mystery because it is a long gone era and it is also because of the immense influence by the values of our colonizers. However difficult it may be to imagine, our country was actually already infused with rich beliefs and traditions before we were colonized. The first people in our country that is, the Negritos from Borneo, Sumatra, and Malaya were hunter-gatherers. Eventually, between uh, 3000 BC and 2000 BC, they learned to farm. So they grew rice and they domesticated animals. From the 10th AD century, Filipinos traded with China and by the 12th AD century, Arab merchants reached the Philippines and they introduced Islam. These were actually the Muslim Malays from, from Malaysia. The adaptation of early Filipinos to the culture introduced by the Muslims birthed folk Islam. During this period of trading with people from neighboring countries, medieval art in the West was progressing and its focus was on religion and Christianity. Moreover, pre-colonial inhabitants were also already literate. Those who were living in coastal communities were said to be the most literate among early Filipinos, such as the Ilocanos, Pangasinense, the Pampangos, the Tagalogs, the Summer Lady groups, the Negrenses, and the Butuanons. This literacy was noted by the Spaniards when they arrived. A Spanish missionary named Francisco Colin even documented how the people clung fondly to their own methods of writing and reading that even those who were already baptized as Christians still used the indigenous systems of writing and reading. By Bayin is an example of these ancient writing systems or scripts. It was used mainly by the Tagalogs. 
It is believed that there were at least 16 different types of writing systems present around the Philippines prior to our colonization. However, as soon as the Spaniards introduced the Roman alphabet to the early Filipinos, the ancient writing systems were made to look inadequate. So this uh, point of view helped the Spaniards to argue that the Filipinos at that time were not civilized. Also, early Filipinos had already forms of literature. One of these forms was the riddle. They used uh, these early forms of literature to transmit folk wisdom to succeeding generations. The Tagalogs had the short poetic forms, the Tanaga, Dalit, and Diona. Early literature was also mostly transmitted through performed rituals. These literature, which were used in rituals, were repetitive, practiced, and memorized by members of communities. Art was a communal than individualistic property. So every member of the community owned whatever was practiced in their community. Art was a art was communal, not individualistic. Moreover, although early Filipinos had no knowledge of money, they were already experts at evaluating the quality of gold used for trading. Coin specialists have found small gold pieces used as coins. These pieces were not larger than a P, and they had char a character stamped at the base. These coins are called piloncito. Some minerals and crystals were also used as ornaments for beautification. We also had deep indigenous spiritual traditions. Native people believed that the world is inhabited by spirits and supernatural entities. This belief inspired the creation of local gods and goddesses, the sculptures of the Lika, which were images of deities, and the Anito, which were figures for the departed ancestors. We also had performative rituals with chants or songs and dances. Ancient Filipinos also celebrated and recognized the potentials of women. For example, when a woman got her first menstruation, she underwent a ceremony known as dating, where she was blindfolded and secluded in a windowless space for four days. Once her menstrual period was over, she was led to a stream for a bath, but her feet were not allowed to touch the ground, so she was either carried or made to walk on an elevated pathway. When she returned home, oil would be put on her body, which was then followed by two nights of singing. During this time, only females were allowed to be around her. This ceremony also marked the woman as someone who can now be married. The structure of pre-Hispanic Philippine society was neither patriarchal nor matriarchal though. Okay? However, Pre-colonial Filipino women also enjoyed the same rights, privileges, and opportunities of men. Women didn't lose their names. In the Tagalog culture, if the woman was distinguished or a member of a rich family, it is the husband instead who takes the name of the wife. Females were also made to take charge when it comes to finances and land holdings as well as contracts with the Chinese merchants. Moreover, virginity was not seen as a value that should be upheld. When the Spaniards came in 1521, they were shocked by the freedom that women, Filipino women, had because it did not coincide with their idea of how a woman should behave. And so they worked to transform Filipinas into sheltered and reserved women, just like the women in their society. That's the origin of the Lagang Pilipina, okay, Maria Clara. Another notable female role during this period is that of the Babaylan. 
the Babaylan uh, were female mystical healers or shamans whose spiritual connectedness was a source of political and social power. These powerful women were responsible in the healing of the sick, the ensuring of a safe pregnancy and childbirth. They were also responsible for the rituals with offerings to the various divinities. They also connected with the divine by harnessing the unlimited powers of nature. Although the Datu was believed to possess supernatural powers like pangkukulam and barang, the power of the Babaylan matched the power of the Datu. Sometimes, the Datu sought counsel from the Babaylan. When the Spaniards came, of course, they forced the Babaylan to abandon their ritual practices. But instead of giving in, some Babaylans used the images, the Catholic images and rituals to replace their, their likha, anitos, and their diwatas. However, eventually, the god of the Spaniards won, and these Babaylans were branded as witches or mangkukulang. Some were even murdered, and to make sure that their bodies would never return because of their supernatural powers, their bodies were chopped and fed to the crocodiles. While these activities were going on in our country, the Renaissance period was ongoing in the West. So the people in the West, the artists in the West, revisited the classical idealisms of the Greeks and the Romans. So these are examples of art forms which were prominent already before the Spaniards came. So we have here the Dalit uh, poetic form which looks like the haiku form of Japan. So take note that we have our own short poetic forms. So one example is the Dalit. It has four lines, seven syllables each. The Dalit poem is one example of the traditional or ethnic form used by the, the Western people or by the Spaniards to, to infiltrate our culture. So since there was this language problem or communication problem, they used uh, local forms in order to communicate with us. For example, they used the Baybayin script okay, to communicate with Filipinos. They also made use of the prominent or the well-known forms in masses, Catholic masses. So if you would look closely at the responsorial psalm during mass, a Catholic mass, you would recognize the form uh, with resembling a diona, which is an example of an ethnic or a traditional poetic form of the Tagalogs. Okay, so this is the Piloncy, the gold coin. We have here the ornaments found in the cave somewhere in Palawan. This is an example of a likha portraying a deity. Okay, so these are the example art forms which were already um, developed and used, performed in our country before the Spaniards came. When the Spaniards arrived in 1521, the colonizers used art as a tool to propagate the Catholic faith through beautiful images. With communication as a problem, the friars used images to explain the concepts behind Catholicism. They also used the native forms to connect with the natives. For example, they used the native poetic forms of the Tagalogs in the Mass. The Salmong Tugunan or Responsorial Psalm in a Catholic Mass resembles the Diona or the Dalit forms of the Tagalogs. The Likha and Anito images were destroyed and replaced by carved images in paintings on walls of the Holy Family, angels, and saints. The indigenous and pagan stories, chants, songs, and rituals were substituted with the way of the cross, the passion, sinaculo, and the other Catholic 
rituals or celebrations. Moreover, since the friars controlled the publication and even commissioned artisans to create Catholic-themed art forms, art during this period, the beginning of Spanish colonization, was only for religious and church use until the 19th century. The commissioned artists learned to copy two-dimensional art forms which were given to them by the friars from Spain. The 300-year reign of Spaniards almost completely cleaned our slate. The native tradition was only somehow conserved through the oral traditions of far-flung ethnic communities who were not directly exposed to, to the influence of the colonizers. The Tagalogs unfortunately lost their indigenous literature because of the direct colonial rule. Native literature was replaced by forms that mirrored the life of medieval Europe. Here are example artworks depicting the effects of the previously mentioned social condition. So you can see here a page of or pages of Doctrina Christiana book. So the friars used the Baibayin script to as well as Latin to communicate with the natives of the Philippines in order for them to read the stories about uh, of Christ, about the stories of Christ, Mary, the Holy Family, the saints the angels and so on and so forth they used the the local script okay so we have also here an example of uh, a glass work which is obviously influenced by the art practices or styles in Europe this is very gothic in style and an example Catholic Church Eventually, some native Filipinos acquired economic wealth due to the development of the agricultural export economy. They became the Ilustrados. These Ilustrados sent their children to universities in Europe, and they brought home with them their education. The Ilustrados became the new patrons of art. So instead of the friars only, commissioning artists, the Ilustrados started commissioning artisans as well. This paved way to the secularization of Philippine arts. With more tourists, Ilustrados, and foreigners demanding souvenirs and decorations from the country, Tipos del País, which translates to types of the country, developed in painting. It is a style of watercolor painting that showed the different types of inhabitants in the Philippines in their different native costumes. Damian Domingo was the most popular artist who worked in this style. Damian Domingo is also known as the father of Filipino painting. He is also the first great Filipino painter and he was the one who founded the Academia de Dibujo y Pintura, the first school of drawing in the Philippines in 1821. Moreover, the rise of the Ilustrados saw a, an increase in the demand of the art of portraiture. The Ilustrados needed to adore their newly constructed Bahay na Bato and they also wanted to document their newfound wealth and social status. So they commissioned painters to make portraits of themselves. The works of painters like Simon Flores captured the intricately designed jewels, the fashion accessories, the minute details of their embroidered clothes, their ornamented and domestic furniture, and so this style became miniaturismo. This painting style is painstakingly placing into the painting 
even the smallest details of the subject of the painting. So it became uh, famous during this period because of the new patrons of painting who were the illustrados. Here are the example artworks based on the mentioned details on the previous slides. This is an example of a, a family portrait by Simon Flores, which or wherein he employed the style or the painting style, miniaturismo. And so the details, the intricate and the very small details are still included in the painting. This is, these are examples of Tipos del Pais paintings. And this is a portrait by Damian Domingo. This is Damian Domingo, the father of Filipino painting. Moreover, in 1849, Gobernador General Narciso Claveria issued a decree that all Philippine natives should assume Spanish names. A painting style, Letras y Figuras, which translates to letters and figures, was developed by artist Jose Honorato Lozano. It combined both tipos del país and genre paintings by forming the letters of the customer's or patron's name from figures of people in local costumes doing everyday activities. It also utilized landscape scenes as background. Several Filipino painters also had the chance to study and work abroad. Among them was Felix Resurrection Hidalgo, who became the first international Filipino artist who won the gold and silver medals in the 1884 Madrid Exposition. Another notable Filipino artist is Mariano Baldemore Madridan, who sculpted Mater Dolorosa in 1883. He received a prestigious award from the King of Spain, Alfonso XII, during the International Exposition in Amsterdam. Madrinan is considered by historians as the first Filipino to have won an international award in sculpture. So on this slide is an example of a work by Jose Honorato Lozano, who invented the Letras y Figuras painting style, wherein the letters of the name of a patro patron uh, is figured or is based on the figures of people in local costumes. Okay, the background is a landscape scene. You can also see here the masterpieces by Hidalgo and Madrinan. Their works are undeniably influenced by the styles of medieval Europe, which celebrated the, Gro uh, the Greco Roman styles. Take note that the Greco, -Roman, the, the Greco Roman artistic styles dominated and progressed in the West during this period in the Philippines. Okay, now, so we move on to the next era or to the next period of our country's history which is the American occupation. Our freedom from the Spaniards was short-lived. After more than 300 years of colonial rule under Spain, we were occupied by the Americans next, and they conquered us through education and governance. They were here for 48 years. In 1935, the Commonwealth of the Philippines was established with the approval of the U.S., and Manuel Quezon was elected as the country's first president. In the beginning of the American occupation, although public education was free and no longer for the elites, English was the only language used as medium of instruction. Okay? Spanish and the other major dialects of the country were excluded from use in the classrooms. So therefore, the literary forms discussed in the classrooms were also from the authors in the West. English, therefore, became the language of writing and literature of the educated people. Learned Filipinos mastered it in less than two decades. 
The good thing was that the indigenous literature and art forms were preserved through the efforts of the same educated writers and social scientists. The arrival of the new colonial power, of course, caused a shift in art patronage. The new patrons, the Americans, including the tourists and foreign investors, favored landscapes, still life, and genre themes that showed the beauty of the land and its people. Portraits were still favored, though, by the public officials, usually depicting them in dignified poses. Therefrom, the American colonization brought high influence to the major Filipino art forms, which are paintings, sculptures, and architecture. Fabian de la Rosa, no, it's not him in the picture, okay? Fabian de la Rosa, this is not him in the picture. It is instead Fernando Omar Solo. He's also mentioned in the slide. Okay, so to continue, Fabian de la Rosa was the first painter of note for the 20th century. He was noted for his realistic portraits, genre, and landscapes in subdued colors or cooler colors. De la Rosa is often considered the brightest name in Filipino painting and certainly the most important for the first quarter of the century. However, it was his nephew, the, the guy in the picture, Fernando Amorsolo, who captured the attention of the public and the buyers. And he is the one who had a long artistic career. Spanning for more than half a century, his influence is still evident in some of today's painters. Fernando Amarsolo, again the guy in the picture, was named as the country's first national artist in 1972. Fernando Amarsolo's paintings burst with yellow, orange, and golden sunlight that captured the Philippine landscape and all its glory. In contrast, De La Rosa's works were of subdued, cool colors. Amor Solo also idealized the rural life of the working men and women of the Philippines. He depicted Filipino farmers and fisher folks as if they are doing their work without much effort. His depiction of the ever-smiling Dalagang Bukid is also another trademark of Amor Solo. Amor Solo was therefore able to show the ideal beauty of the Philippine landscape, the Philippine rural life, and the Filipinas. Fernando Amor Solo also ventured into advertising. He made several book and magazine cover designs. He also designed for commercial products, just like the famous Marcang Dimonio for Ginebra San Miguel, our local alcoholic drink, the gin. So it's Fernando Amorsolo who designed that one. So you next time you go drinking with buddies or with titos and titas, remember that that particular design is actually Fernando Amorsolo's work. A national artist, the first national artist of the country. Moreover, the Americans established the University of the Philippines in 1908. The School of Fine Arts was established the following year in 1909 and Fabian de la Rosa became its first dean. It functioned as the local academy for art. Fernando Marsolo became a faculty member and he also became the dean of the UP School of Fine Arts from 1938 to 1952. It was therefore inevitable for students to emulate the works and style of Fernando Amorsolo. Hence, the Amorsolo School was born. Followers included George Pineda, Ireneo Miranda, Dominador Castaneda, and Pablo Amorsolo. However, in 1920s, several young painters started to question the Amorsolo School style that became the standard for painting. So they wanted to veer away from the aesthetic standards and they strove to develop new idioms in expressing themselves. 
Here are example paintings by Amor Solo and De La Rosa. You can clearly see the difference between the two artists' styles. Amor Solo's painting bursts with yellow-orange hues, while De La Rosa's work contains subdued cool colors. In 1935, Rafael Palma, the president of the University of the Philippines, commissioned Guillermo Tolentino to sculpt the oblation. It is a statue based on the second stanza of Jose Rizal's Mi Ultimo Adios. Tolentino made use of concrete to create the statue, but it was painted to look like bronze. Tolentino was a Filipino sculptor. Upon his return from Europe, where he was enrolled at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Rome. He was appointed as professor in 1925 at the University of the Philippines School of Fine Arts. He was also designated as a National Artist of the Philippines for Sculpture in 1973. He also sculpted the Bonifacio Monument in Caloocan as well as the Seal of the Republic of the Philippines. Here are the example masterpieces of Guillermo Tolentino. And now we move on to the discussion of the harrowing years of war under the Japanese occupation. The Japanese occupied our country from 1942 to 1945. During these years of war, the Filipinos were very scared to express their opinions, and so the artistic activities were also suspended. However, there were some artists who managed to produce artworks based on the atrocities brought by the war. Literature used for communication by the guerrillas was produced in secret as well. The common themes of artworks during these years were wartime scenes, suffering, and propaganda. Examples are Dominador Castaneda's Doomed Family and Fernando Amor Solo's Defense of a Filipino Woman's Honor, which is a painting that depicts his unspoken defiance against the oppression during that time. So you can see here the examples of or the paintings of the mentioned uh, artists in the previous slide. This is the painting by Castaneda entitled Doom the Family. The mother is dead, she's bleeding. Father is obviously with marks of whips. Her head is tied with a rope and their child tied as well with a silent scream on her face. This picture or this painting by Fernando Amor Solo uh, shows the image of a man trying to defend a Filipina woman. I suppose uh, this is her, uh, this is his wife, and I believe that somewhere in the picture is a hidden Japanese soldier who's about to infiltrate the, the home of this Filipino family. So these two paintings depict the horrors brought by the war to the Filipinos. Ten months after the end of the Second World War, our country was declared free by the United States. Our independence from the Americans was declared on July 4, 1946, in accordance with the Philippine Independence Act, or more popularly known as the Tidings McDuffie Act. Under the governance by virtue of President Ferdinand Marcos on April 2, 1972, the first National Artist of the Philippines Award was given by the NCCA to Fernando Amorsolo.
Below are the benefits when a person is awarded this honor. Artworks produced after the Second World War are called modern art. Our country boasts of having one of the longest traditions of modern art in Asia. Thanks to our early links with America and to the pioneering achievements of Filipino artists who broke away from the classical conventions that dominated pre-war painting and sculpture. Art historians would later refer to this group as the 13 moderns. Their art styles vary, such as Expressionism, Surrealism, and Abstract Expressionism. One of the 13 moderns is Victorio C. Edades. Fresh from a trip to the United States in 1928, he opened a show at the Philippine Colombian Club in Ermita, Manila. Edades would be influenced by the 1913 Armory Show, an exhibition of modern art at the United States. He eventually emerged as the father of modern Philippine painting. He was also awarded the National Artist for Painting in 1976. Unlike Amor Solo's bright, sunny, cheerful hues, Edades' colors were dark and somber with subject matter or themes depicting laborers, factory workers, or the simple folk in all the dirt, sweat, and grime. In the 1930s, he taught at the University of Santo Tomas and became the dean of its Department of Architecture, where he stayed for three full decades. It was during this time that he introduced a liberal arts program that offers subjects as art history and foreign languages that will lead to a bachelor's degree in fine arts. This development brought about the first in Philippine education since art schools then were vocational schools. It was also the time that Edades invited Carlos Francisco or Carlos Botong Francisco and Galo Ocampo, who were dropouts of UP School of Fine Arts to become professor artists for the university, UST. The three, who would later be known as the formidable triumvirate, led the growth of mural painting in the country. Another one of the 13 moderns is Carlos Francisco or Botong Francisco. He was an Angona-based painter who was also national artist for painting in 1973. He depicted Philippine history in his History of Manila mural at the Manila City Hall. His trademark fluid lines and brilliant colors filled up the entire pictorial space of the mural, defying the rules of linear perspective set by the local academy. 
And here are the works of Edades and Francisco. And these are the other members of the so-called 13 Moderns. Aside from the 13 Moderns, there were also self-taught artists who were called neorealists who created art as a reaction to the perceived academic and sentimental status of art in the previous generation. One such modern artist is Hernando Ocampo. His works were abstract and inspired by science fiction writing and the Filipino landscape, which he portrayed by using biomorphic shapes. He used extremely bold color palettes and his paintings depicted the impact of World War II. Napoleon Abueva is another modern artist, modern Filipino artist. He went against the standards set by his teacher, Guillermo Tolentino. He worked with a variety of materials and techniques. He helped shape the local sculpture scene to what it is now. His style was representational and modern abstract, and he utilized almost all kinds of materials from wood to metal, cement, bronze, coral, and so on. So you can see here the example artworks by the two mentioned artists, the Genesis by Ocampo and the Transfiguration by Napoleon Abueva. You can see this sculpture at the Eternal Gardens Memorial Park. And so we now move on to the last period of Philippine art history, which focuses on contemporary Philippine art. Contemporary Philippine artworks are those which were produced beginning the year 1970. So therefore, the work by Abueva, which is the Transfiguration, is actually an example of a contemporary sculpture. The contemporary Philippine artworks, therefore, include those which are made by artists in the 21st century. Contemporary Philippine arts, just like the contemporary arts of the rest of the world, mirror contemporary culture and society. These artworks showcase a dynamic combination of materials, methods, concepts, and subjects that challenges traditional boundaries and defies easy definition. So it's really, it's typically difficult to define what a contemporary art should look like, okay? Because basically it's still developing, okay? There are different styles and methods coming out and they are sometimes being recognized. Perhaps these contemporary artists would eventually be given a place under the sun after so many years when a new era would come out. Aside from the transfiguration by Abueva, who is known to be a modern artist, we also have the example artworks by Ang Kyoko, the Fisherman, which was completed in 1981, and the People Power Monument by Eduardo Castrillo, which he completed in 1993. If you want to read more about the points mentioned in this lecture, you may check out these references. This is the end of Lesson 3. Thank you for your time and for listening.